Quote, To me, this entire region resembles nothing so much as an area sapped by a powerful electric arc advancing unsteadily across the surface, occasionally splitting in two, and now and then weakening so that its traces narrow and even degrade into lines of disconnected craters. I can only wonder, is it possible that Mars was bled of several million cubic kilometers of soil and rock in a single encounter with another planetary body? Might the canyon lands of Mars have been created in an event perhaps hinted at by Homer when he wrote, Athena, Venus, drove the spear straight into his, Ares or Mars's belly, where the kilt was girded, the point ran in and tore the flesh, and Ares roared like a trumpet. End quote. These words come from Of the Moon and Mars Part 2, Searching for the Scars of Battle by Ralph E. Jurgens. His commentary on the early Viking spacecraft images. If true, they're a pretty heavy statement. These words require us to suspend disbelief and entertain a story wholly different than what we've been handed by the experts. They tell the story of a dynamic and active solar system within human memory, and that goes at odds with the gradualism we've been assured of without even the faintest shadow of a doubt by experts. But Jurgens knew better. He also knew the moment he saw Valus Marineris that he was looking at the work of an electric arc, something that once you see, you can't unsee it. But if it is true, one might wonder, where do you get a lightning bolt that big? Well, Jurgens, like Velikovsky, believe that when planets get too close to one another, they discharge. Gargantuan interplanetary lightning arcs. This kind of arc would have no problem stripping rock and gases from a planet's surface. The electric force is billions of times stronger than the gravity that governs planets. And you can bet when something like this happens, it's going to leave a scar. Out of every proposed backstory for Valus Marineris, there is only one that can reasonably explain 2 million cubic kilometers of material yeeted off world, along with 90% of the Martian atmosphere. Cool as all that is, it's the scar left behind to tell the true story. The writing is on the wall, you might say, and the language is one we know well. Electric arcs are used all over the industrial world, and that could be why so many proponents of the electric universe model have a background in electricity. For the trained eye, there's little question we're looking at electric scars on Mars. These are the same kinds of characteristic signatures of electrical arcing that we see in our laboratory experiments. Small, sinuous channels that run along the floor of larger channels, just like that lightning scar at Baker, Florida in 1949. Crater chains, parallel rivers that have no problem flowing up hills or right through them without any topo damage to suggest later vertical movement of the terrain. Perfectly circular craters running along the lengths of the channels, usually with secondary craters on their rim or centers. Some have flat floors and steep sides, just like we see in the lab. Others have V-shaped cross-sections. Tributaries, if any, are often short end in circular alcoves and then join the main channels at right angles. Obviously water doesn't do any of this, so the brains over at Big Space are constantly cooking up ways imaginary water channels can happen by and then collapse under the surface. In these dendritic patterns. That just happen to always look like electric scars. <laughs> okay. You'd think water channels would produce more of a variety instead of keeping to the same dendritic structures lightning arcs do, at least if this was water. Along the bottoms of the channels, we see what look like sand dunes. Some have material heaped up on each side to form levees. And then you've got huge main channels and tributaries, but no sign of where they came from. No feeder streams or catchments that could come close to explaining the volumes of water that would have been necessary to carve out these canyons. And just like with the Colorado River back on Earth, no outflows. Where did all that eroded soil go? Quote, The real actors on the stage of the universe are very few, if their adventures are many. The most ancient treasure, in Aristotle's words, that was left to us by our predecessors of the high and far-off times was the idea that the gods are really stars. And all the stories, characters, and adventures narrated by mythology concentrate on the active powers among the stars, who are planets. End quote. Giorgio di Santiana and Hertha von Duchenne in Hamlet's Mill. Quote. 
The thunder god is regarded as the most powerful of all gods of heaven and earth, since the effects of his anger are so terrible and evident. End quote. Christopher Blinkenberg, Thunder Weapon in Religion and Folklore You don't need a Hadron Collider to test these theories. Engineers have been able to replicate just about all the mysterious landforms the experts can't figure out. Running a subsurface arc through similar stratum to Mars in a lab here on Earth easily produces the giant canyon's own mini-me. How do both the Grand Canyon and its off-world neighbors exhibit so many similar formations and details? Well, let's start with the parallelism we often see. These canyons often run side by side, something we never see rivers doing. This is because of the long-term magnetic attraction of current filaments and their short-range but stronger electrostatic repulsion. Look close at the small parallel rills composed essentially of crater chains. A traveling underground explosion follows the lightning streamer and cleanly forms the V-shaped tributary canyons. There is no collapsed debris and no undercutting water flow is necessary here. You see similar V-cross sections in craters formed by underground nuclear explosions. And the circular ends of the tributaries where the explosions began are shaped exactly the same. Keep in mind, headward erosion made by groundwater sapping gives a U-shaped cross-section, and there doesn't seem to be any pattern for these ending in a circular alcove like we see on Mars. Notice some of the tributary canyons on the south rim of Valles Marineris cut across one another at nearly right angles. This might be caused by repeated discharges from the same area chasing the main stroke as it traveled along Lust Chasma. Again, water does not do this. The fluted appearance of the main canyon wall is probably due to the same traveling explosive action that curved the V tributaries. Here's another major premises of geology. Sedimentation occurs in basins where large quantities of fast-running surface water can deliver a thick stack of sediment to the area. But is this correct? Well, thanks to Vallis Marineris, we can see evidence of widespread sedimentary layering along the canyon walls. But where do the sediments come from? Ballas Marineris isn't in a basin. In fact, it's near the top of a bulge about 10 kilometers above the datum. How are sediments supposed to be brought up here? How come these geologists keep forgetting that water can't flow up hills? In order for this kind of sedimentation to exist on the walls of the canyon, it would have needed to form in a deep basin with tons of rushing water, and then get uplifted an incredible 20 kilometers. I mean, maybe some kind of mantle plume or volcanic activity could do it if there was any volcanism in the area. There isn't. Just like sinuous channels are not necessarily carved by flowing water, and craters are not necessarily created by meteor impacts, sedimentation layering does not require formation in a basin with running water. The electrical model provides a far simpler solution no one over at Big Space seems to want to consider. Case in point, we know material removed electrically is going to land somewhere. And in the case of Mars, that material might be the rubble covering the entire northern hemisphere of the planet. Meanwhile, the southern hemisphere has been machined down almost five kilometers, leaving behind a much smoother surface, pockmarked in vast numbers of craters, all angled at 90 degrees. Just like a piece of sheet metal machined with an arc. And that would certainly explain sedimentation we find high over the basins of Mars. Keep in mind, we see the same kind of sedimentation layering on the moon as well along with the same kinds of electrical scars. Obviously, no basins of fast-flowing water there. But what does Vallis Marineris have to do with the Grand Canyon? Well, we see the same major features on both, and that does suggest common backstories. If water's a no-go in one place, then it's a no-go in both. Let's look at the similarities. The Grand Canyon is on a high plateau. So is Vallis Marineris. The tributaries are all deeply incised, short, and tend to end in round alcoves in both canyons, not to mention looking strikingly similar. Both are missing all their excavated material. Where did it go? No river outflows. The edges of both canyons are sharp and don't show much erosion in their deep valleys, something that hints at a more recent formation for both. But to look a little deeper at Vallis Marineris, it turns out we may not have to go to Mars we can get a closer look at some of these formations right here on Earth. NASA and the SETI Institute have set up a base camp in Devon Island, Nunavut Territory in the Canadian High Arctic, for the study of the Houghton Impact Crater and its surroundings. 
They call it the Houghton Mars Project because the unexplored island is considered a Mars analog. That is, a place where the geologic features match up with Mars pretty well. On Devon Island, we see a lot of what the standard model calls glacial meltwater networks. Several types of valleys that look a lot like the ones we see on Mars. It's a resemblance that seems to be more than superficial. These glacial meltwater networks get compared to the tributary canyons of Valles Marineris, and the experts say this is the best evidence for episodes of sustained water erosion on the Red Planet. Trouble is, they lump in a bunch of unusual characteristics that can't be explained by water erosion. 1. The valleys are spaced apart, with large dissected areas between valleys. 2. The valleys display open, branching patterns with large, undissected areas between the branches. 3. The branches often have ill-defined sources, but mature in width and depth over short distances relative to the size of the network. 4. Branches maintain relatively constant width and depth over long distances. 5. Branches split and rejoin to form steep-walled islands. 6. Branches have V-shaped walls and flat floors. 7. Channels on valley floors are absent or poorly expressed. Their scale also varies over an order of magnitude. In other words, all the same features we already talked about on Valles Marineris and the Grand Canyon. It even has a nearby crater. But weirdly, geologists explain these same formations yet another way. They claim these electric scars were carved out by glaciers under the ice sheets long ago. Some of them even have a little ice left in them to this day. Obviously, glaciers aren't cutting anything out of Mars or Venus, nor the moon. And nobody is suggesting we get the Grand Canyon this way. Now, unless we want to pull a new cause out of the hat for every canyon, no matter if they all share the same obviously electrical and laboratory reproducible features, then we're going to find our science is growing stranger and more confusing by the day, and prediction will become just about impossible, which is exactly where we are with the standard model. And that leads me to a question. What if we've been studying the physics of an incorrect major premise since the day scientists assumed that charged particles accelerating from the sun were somehow not an electric current, despite what Ralph Jurgens tried to tell them? What if the idea that space is held together by gravity was a mistake? Think of how much of the standard model is predicated on that axiom. Immediately, all those physics equations to show how black holes, big bangs, and supercondensed matter work become about as useful as a forum discussing whether the Hulk could take on Superman. I mean, it's fun, but it's not particularly useful. Now, the debunkers will say we don't understand the physics, though clearly they've never met Don Scott. But in my case, yeah, sure, you're right, buddy. I don't understand the physics of black holes, and I don't understand how Harry Potter's magic spells work either. But that's because neither of them are real. There's a pretty good chance you guys have been studying the physics of science fiction for a hundred years. So I have to ask, what seems more reasonable? That the Colorado River flowed uphill, then drilled its way through a plateau instead of going around? Or that it just took advantage of channels that were already there, carved out by cosmic lightning? Do we really need a new explanation for each canyon we find when there's already one solution that can be used to describe exactly what we see both here and across the solar system? One solution we can test and replicate in small laboratories with no need of a zillion dollar hydron collider? The electric force does all of this, out of the box. No mysterious particles or forces we can actually observe needed. Is it truly the answer to canyon formation in our solar system? Now, who can say for sure? But as a theory, it makes as much or more sense than the rest of the ideas being proposed. And as much as the experts would like you to look the other way, the electric force is in this debate. It's grounded in reason and backs its claims up with laboratory experimentation and direct observation. No hidden particles, no sneaky out-of-sight solutions, just simple laboratory-tested theory using forces we know are real. Well, I can't claim this is the theory of everything, I can say that science is supposed to simplify things. And there's nothing simple about the standard model, and it's rarely predictive.